Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Sargent. I am Chevy Chase at Home's member and volunteer programs manager. As you may know, Chevy Chase at Home engages adults 55 and older in social and educational programming, both in person and virtually. We also provide volunteer services to older adults who need that assistance to remain in their homes, including rides, tech support, and minor household chores. We are so glad to have you join us this afternoon for this edition of our speaker series. Bob Levenluft, who is a member of Chevy Chase at Home's Board of Directors and a member of the Guest Speakers Committee, is going to introduce today's speaker, Chris Wright, and will, and will moderate today's talk. Before I turn it over to Bob, just one note of housekeeping. Um, we'll save questions to the end, and at the end, you can feel free to um, unmute yourself and, and ask any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm Bob Liebenloft uh, on the board, as, as Kristen mentioned, and it's my pleasure to um, introduce today's speaker, who's Chris Wright, who's a next door neighbor of ours. Um, Chris and uh, we li live in, in the town of Chevy Chase for over 30 years. And uh, you may, if you, if you live in the town, you probably have seen Chris and his wife, Polly, uh, walking their dog a lot. They, they spent a lot of time on the streets of, of the town of Chevy Chase. Um, as you've seen from his bio, Chris um, came to um, bird watching a bit late, but he's uh, caught up um, with that late start. He uh, apparently has seen, um, logged in 629 species, but what's even more impressive is the uh, 85 species he's seen in Montgomery County, which is the focus of his talk today. Um, he and I have um, shared some, some birding stories. I'm not a birder, but I do come to Chris with various questions and he's pointed out like the sound the the, the loud rat tat tat that we've heard in the morning um and we thought somebody was uh constructing something on our roof was actually a woodpecker and he's pointed out uh that um uh, we've had various nests of birds living in our house so we had no idea our house was such a a haven for for local birds but um uh, they they are and what's and also the owls that we hear at night so there's all kinds of things going on in our town, which I think if we listen to and, and look for, um, are, are really quite fascinating. Um, Chris gave a talk on, on, on local birds a, a year or two ago um, during the pandemic uh, for the town, and it was a, just a, a fabulous discussion. And so I was really um, glad that he was willing to do this again um, for this audience. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Will, in terms of, of housekeeping, Will, he has a pretty, um, uh, 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 large uh, number of slides and things to talk about. And I think we'll do questions at the end, but Chris says that he's he'll be available to talk to questions. Um, and even if we go beyond three, he'll be, he'll, be, he'll be glad to do that. So I'll turn it up to you, Chris. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you, Kristen. Welcome everybody. Good, good afternoon. Um, I, I first of all, don't want you to be daunted by the idea that there are 30 birds that you can actually see out your back window. It is the truth. But, and you'll know all of them just about before we even start. It's, it's kind of like, this is kind of like giving a neighborhood party. If, you know, you're, you're negotiating who's going to come, who on the block. And he's, well, you know, if we ask the robins, we have to include the starlings. And if the chickadees come, then we have to have to sit nice next door. And, and so I had to pack all these birds in because they're all here right in our block. Um, they, they moved here for the same reason most of us did for the trees, for the uncredited neighborhood. And these are mostly woodland birds because we live in, in the woods. Uh, my, many of them, like us, are year-round residents. And I think almost every one will be familiar to you. But let's, let's start with the one that's, that's that one, the noisy one, the one that's on your phone today. These are the woodpeckers. They, it's easy to see them. They're, they're up in the air. And there are quite a few of them, actually. The, the first one. Um, I say they're not migratory birds. These are, these are birds that live right here all the time, eat insects, and peck on our trees. The, the one that everybody knows is, is this is not a red-headed woodpecker. This is a red-bellied woodpecker, and I'll show you why in a minute. But you hear these guys churring away. They're the, probably the most noticeable bird in, in the whole neighborhood. And as Bob said, they, they're often right on your drain pipe. Somebody described them as, as capricious and, and pugnacious. They are a bird that's always there. They're always at the feeder. And, and 
they're fun. They're, they're always around us in one place or another. They do have a habit of, of rattling their bowl on the drain pipes and waking up about seven o'clock in the morning. And you think, well, what is this stupid bird? He's not gonna knock a hole in our drain pipe and make a nest. He's not, not gonna knock a hole in your drain pipe. He thinks your drain pipe is the best echoing place in the whole world to make his sound. Because aside from that cheering sound, they don't really have a song. And so what he does is he rattles on your drain pipe, he hammers away at it, telling other red belly woodpeckers, this is my territory, this is my place, and don't come around, this is my drain pipe. It's, it's, it's just proclaiming his territory. And he'll get over this once he gets, gets a mate and gets a nest and they, things, he gets busy catching bugs to feed his little ones. He doesn't have time to, dry, to bang your drain pipe. But right now, he's really on the drain pipe and you've probably heard him lots. So that's the red-bellied woodpecker. Now, I will say, why is he red-bellied? If you look at the one on the left there, that's a male red-bellied woodpecker. And just, I don't have a good picture of this, but right underneath his sort of where the peanuts are, you'll see just a little blush on his belly. And because when they were naming woodpeckers, when the Europeans were naming woodpeckers here, they'd already had the, the red-headed woodpecker. Which looks, there's the woodpecker, looks like they dumped his head in a jam jar. He's red right down to his neck. These guys obviously are not red down to their neck. So they said, well, what are we gonna call this one? Can't call him red bellied. Oh, well, he's dead. And I turned him over and there he was and in his hand, he had a red belly. So that's, that's sort of sad. He was a dead woodpecker when they named him, but that's why he's called red belly. Nobody else, nobody looks at it and they say, why he's not red belly? Well, he's just slightly red. The one on the right, and this is where you can, you can amaze your friends. The one on the right is the female and the female doesn't have red all the way down to her nose whereas the male is red all the way down actually to the bill. So that's, that's a way to tell them apart. Now, this is a young one and he doesn't really have red at all. They, that, you'll see these little birds in late summer when they're, they're hatched and out and you'll find them like this on the, the, uh, they're on, on the peanut feeder. Do you see the tongue? That tongue sticking out there is the way they actually are supposed to make a living. This is what it looks like inside their head. They, what the, the way all woodpeckers do is they chip a piece of bark off of a tree and they go underneath the bark and pull out the, the, the grub, which has a hole. So they, they listen, listen, they hop up and down the side of the tree, they listen for a grub or, or smell, I don't know how, they, I guess they, they can sense somewhere in there that there's a grub underneath there. They'll peck off a piece of bark and then they'll stick that tongue down in there and, and spear the grub and pull it out and that's, that's breakfast. So that's, that's how that worked. Now, the next woodpecker, we have really three woodpeckers here, the red belly and the cute little one is the downy woodpecker. Downies are small. They're, they're about, about two thirds the size of the red belly. They're not pugnacious particularly. They're, they're just well-mannered and cute. And, and this, is, this is a male. He has a little red spot on the back of his head. You can tell this is an old slide. When did you last see snow? Well, I took it during the snowstorm a while back. This is the male on the left. This is the female on the right. He doesn't have that. I don't know if you can hear that little, can you hear the, the very sharp peak and a whinny kind of sound? That's, that's their sound. And, and you can tell they're pecking too because they make a much faster pecking. So there, if you can hear that at all. Um, it's very high pitched and it's a very, soft sort of whinny and you'll hear them in the trees and they they fly from tree to tree in a sort of nice undulating flight they're just a very pretty bird so you have the red belly which is the big guy and then then you have the little downy this this sort of cute little soft and they're called downies because in the middle of their back there is a there's a this patch of white and when they named them they they found that was just downy and soft and they named for that little bit of bit of white this is the chick. That's just, just to prove to you that we actually do. The, they do lay eggs and they do have little ones right here in our own neighborhood. This is right on my, my deck, deck rail about two years ago. Cute little guy. Now, this is Woody Woodpecker. It, you, will, you hear that? You occasionally hear this in the woods. These, these are affiliated woodpeckers. They're the largest woodpecker we have. And they are very noisy. They're, they're interesting because they live here in Chevy Chase because we have lots of old trees. And of course, they keep 
either falling down or being cut down or the, the rotten branches keep being cut off so they won't fall on our heads. But you know, they're actually a wonderful woodpecker for our area. They, they live in big old holes and big old trees. And the interesting thing about them is they were almost extinct in the 1900s because they cleared all the land for farmland. And they just come back now as, as suburbs have matured and the trees have matured and, and there's plenty of places for these guys to live. Uh, their, their diet, as in all woodpeckers, is primarily beetles and larvae. And you'll find them on the ground. They, are, they're, uh, they like to poke around a fallen log. If you have a fallen log in the backyard, hope for a pileated woodpecker. So that's, this is a picture a friend of mine took. Did you see this, this sawdust? Just banging away at that, that tree. She, she caught just all the, he, they just, there's a lot of force in, in that, uh, in that, that sort of wonderful deep sound. Now, <clears throat> this is a, a woodpecker, but not in the sense that you would think it. They're, they're yellow belly sap suckers, and they are, they're what's called passage migrants. They come through here from going from Florida and Central America to New England and Canada, where they actually breed in, in, in the boreal forest. But they come, come down, down through here. Um, most of them have left by now. You, the, the thing that, that you will see that, that makes you realize they're around is this, if you can see this row of like, like machine gun bullet holes in the trees. They, they're called sap wells and they make, they, they drill these little shallow holes and the tree bleeds through those holes and they drink the sap and they eat the insects that are attracted by that. And they'll set up shop here for a week or two. And, and you know, they'll live here until as, as it gets warmer, they move north and, and end up in, in Canada. And then in the fall, they come back through and do the same thing again. And the next slide shows kind of what happens. Here are, this, this the one on the bottom is a, an adult male, I guess it is. Is a, is a young one that's coming through. They had, the top was born in Canada. He's coming through here, heading for Florida for the winter. So that's, that's the, the yellow belly sapsucker. Again, a, red, a woodpecker, not what you'd quite call a woodpecker, but you'll see them around. The next one, again, is not what you think of as a woodpecker, but it's, it is one. And it's called a northern flicker. In this case, a yellow shafted flicker. And they're around, they live here and they breed here. So they come up from Florida in the, in the early spring, and you kind of know it know it's spring if you if you see them up in the top of a tree like this. They're very much birds way up at the top of the tree, and they make this funny sound. Wicka 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 wicka. That's 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 what it's. They they just it's a it's like a stuck record. It's going on and on and on and on from the very top of the tree. And they their diet, interestingly, is ants. They love the ants and they're really on the ground, even though they're a woodpecker. They they make a hole and have their nest in the hole, but they they will go go for ants on the ground. So you often see them in the lawn. And if you notice here, this is a male. He has a red patch on the back of his head, which most field females and males have, but he also has a mustache. So the male male flicker has a mustache, and here's a group of them on the ground. This is this is very typical of what you might look out the window one morning and see. So there there are the there are the woodpeckers, the ones up high that all of us can see, and I think you can you can remember them. There's the downy and the, and the red belly. There's the pili the big old pileated that looks like woody woodpecker. There's the sapsucker. And then there's this, the, uh, the flicker. So now, okay, we're on the ground. So maybe we should stay on the ground and see what else is on there. Robins, have you, have you ever seen a robin? Everybody's seen a robin. It's kind of interesting. What do we know about robins? They're singing now, they're noisy, they make lots of song. Lots of this kind of cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. It, the interesting about, thing about robins is there are a lot of them. They love us because we have lawn and they love to eat, go after the earthworms in the lawn. This is not, they were named, of course, for the English robin, which is a red, little, cute little robin red vest. This is actually a big thrush and it doesn't look, look or seem anything like the English robin, but that's all right. 
that's that's the way it is. Um, we've named it, and it's it. It's ours. The there's a curiosity about them is that they're migratory, but we don't really know who's migrating. So there's a bunch of robins that eat your holly berries, and are around all winter. And you say, well, you, what's the first robin in the spring? That's, that's an English phrase because the first robin in the spring here might be a robin that's that's going north from Florida and ends up here. It might be just a robin that's been here all winter. And then vice versa. We don't, there, there are robins that are there in, the, in the south going north. There are robins that live here and stay here. There are robins here that are going north from here. And which, which is, they all look alike. We've never banded enough of them to figure out how they actually work. But there are plenty of robins around and they're usually just stripping your holly tree. Um, they're, they're a nice bird. And they, their song is really great. This is a robin looking for, for an earthworm. And it's, it's, they call this the bill pounce. And if you watch, you run along the ground, his head's cocked. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. There he goes. And then they'll go along and, and look for a, a bug or a worm. And then they'll he'll run along the ground again. And now, you, now you, when you see them on the lawn, watch. And you'll see, see them doing this, this funny little bill pounce where they don't just, just sort of walk along and stab. They look and then jump, look and then jump. And you also might see them in the window. <laughs> and, and you may say, well, what is the matter with that robin? He's been flying at that window for the last half hour. What doesn't he know? This robin, well, maybe he isn't that bright. I don't know. This is a robin that was in our window. He's flying at what he thinks is his, his competitor, his rival. It's actually himself reflected in the window. And if you look around to the back of his head, that's, that's Robin Smock, where he's been flying right at the window. So I can't tell you about the intelligence of robins. I can tell you only that that's what happens. And so if you have one flying at your window, don't worry. Dar Darwinian selection, whatever it is, he'll, he'll eventually go away. Now, there's a, the, the starlings, we all know starlings, I'm sure. They're sort of big, big black birds with a yellow bill. And it, we don't like them very much. They're noisy. But they do eat a lot of bugs. They're a very good thing. And the interesting thing about starlings is they, they started with 100 individual birds released in Central Park in 1890-91 by a guy named Eugene Schiffline. He and the American Acclimatization Society thought that they would introduce in America all the birds in Shakespeare. Well, thank you, Eugene. There are now 100 million, 200 million actually, starlings, and they've covered the whole continent. And they're you know, they, they eat a lot of bugs. They do, they compete with the woodpeckers for nest holes. There was a woodpecker that had a nice, he worked on, on a big nest hole in a beech tree next to us about two years ago. And I looked up there one day, hoping to see a, another, a, a female red belly woodpecker. And what did I see with a bunch of starlings? But that, that is, you know, that's what happens. That's nature, you can't do anything about it. A little bit interesting, they, they molt in the fall and, now, my show pictures can't really show it well, but in the fall, when they molt, all their feathers have white tips. And then in the, by the spring, this one isn't quite the same, but by the spring, they are pretty glossy and pretty black all over with a bright yellow bill. And that's just the way, kind of an interesting thing about feathers is feathers wear out. And so they either have to be, they, they always have to be replaced by molting at some time of the year. And when they molt, they are often a different, a slightly different color than, than they are uh, by the end of the season. I had to throw this picture in. You know, they're such charming birds, aren't they? Look at these guys. I, I, yeah, that's exactly, that's a star personality. I ever wanted one. While we're on sort of semi undesirable birds, but birds, you know, you want to be able to recognize them. You want your neighbor, you want to be able to say, as you walk along, oh, look at all those starlings. Not, not all those black birds, but they're starlings. So now we, you know what a starling looks like. Well, here's a bird that looks a little bit like a starling. And it's also on the ground like the starling, but is not. This is a cowbird. And we have them, they, well, I look at the windows like now. I don't, they're, they're on our lawns quite often. They're seed eaters. And the curiosity about the, the, the brown headed cowbird is that they, they did not, they were not originally Eastern birds. Uh, they were called buffalo birds because they followed the, the herds of buffalo out west. 
and somehow they started moving east, probably because there, with the farmland, there was there was the equivalent of of you know grassland prairie, and they just started moving east. They the reason they they are what's known as brood parasites, and they follow the buffalo herds, but the buffalo herds moved, but they wanted to lay their eggs in the nest, obviously. So what did they do? They figured out, well, I'll lay my eggs in somebody else's nest. And then, then I can keep going with the buffalo herds and they, you know, whatever happens to the eggs happens, but I'll I'll be gone. And so what's happened, unfortunately, is it's particularly in the East, the the birds in the East did not evolve with cowbirds or buffaloes or anything else. And when the, the cowbird lays its egg in a songbird nest in the east, the songbird doesn't have sense enough to know it's not a a cardinal, let's say. So there's nothing more pathetic than seeing a warbler or a cardinal feeding a big old brown cowbird, baby cowbird. <laughs> it's just it's just a sad thing. They, I think that they're beginning to figure out that the, the eastern birds are beginning to figure out that that big that big thing in my nest is not that big egg in my nest or whatever is not. Uh, is not really a, a warbler nest. Is not not really a, a cardinal. It's something else, and they cover it over, or they don't hatch it. But but still, that has been a problem for a, a lot of eastern birds. That, that the, the cowbirds have been laying their their eggs in the nest. This is what the two of them look like. If you see them on the grass, the the, the one on the left is a female, and she's just kind of a, there, there's something sort of distinctive about their head that makes them noticeable. But if you look in the ground and you see a bird that's, that's glossy, pretty much glossy black with a brown head, that'd be a male cowbird. And, and they have a kind of a, their, their song is not unattractive. It's sort of a tinkling sound. But those are, are birds, actually Western birds that have moved east. And they're on our ground, on our lawns all the time. Now, all right, uh, let's get off the ground. Who are all these little birds in this feeder? Well, th this particular feeder out back has these are sparrows and and uh, finches, gold, golden house finches, and they, and I'm trying. I was going. Well, never mind. There, there goes Bob's car by instead. Uh, that's a red. We'll we'll just we'll have to pick this up from there. There are really a bunch of finches and a bunch of sparrows that come to our feeders all the time, and you all know about house sparrows. The house sparrow is, is sort of the, the most unwelcome bird around. I keep talking about sort of negative birds. We'll get to some positive birds in a minute. But, but these, are, these are birds that are there. You know, they're our neighbors. And what do we have to put up with? And again, this is not a native bird. The house sparrow was, was introduced from England, uh, but for a very interesting reason. They were interested in 19, in 18, they were introduced in 1851 by a guy named Pike, who was director of the Brooklyn Institute. And he brought 100 English sparrows to Brooklyn because the native sparrows weren't able to, didn't like coming into the cities and they were having a terrible infestation of inchworms in the New York City parks. And apparently they're, they're, they're engravings of women were walking through the parks with, uh, with parasols in the middle of the day because the inchworms were all just dropping out of the trees on them. And it, it must've been quite a problem, not a problem that we can't even imagine. And so he, he brought these hundred little birds in there and lo and behold, they really liked the city and they loved the inchworms. And by that, that was, he, they came, let's figure this out. They came in 1851, 100, um, I don't know, 100, yeah, 100, 100 sparrows in 1851 to Brooklyn. By 1900, these, these sparrows had reached the Rockies. They were in Salt Lake, they'd been introduced into Salt Lake City in San Francisco. They're now the world's most widely distributed wild bird. They just love us. They got here and, and they said, you know, they did one, one farm, one town after another, just an, what somebody called an archipelago of places where they could, they could live. And there was no competition because the, the, the neighbors didn't want to be in the town and, and these guys took over. So that's why you have so many out and it's their own fault. But, you know, they're not too bad. The guy on the left is, is a male and he's a little pugnacious looking, but he's actually pretty colorful little bird when you think about it. And the female is just sort of soft, non, nondescript, but, but sort of pleasing little bird. The, the thing that's unpleasing about them really is just that there's so many of them. But they, if you walk along walking the dog at sunset in the summertime, 
you if you go by a bush and the bush is like it's alive with birds just chattering and chattering and chattering those those are house sparrows and they're all kind of having having a beer before they go to bed <laughs> whatever they're just they're they're very much convivial nice birds so i think you, you got to forgive the house sparrow for being so many it's not their fault they're, they're nice, they're a useful bird. And they, they eat a lot of bugs that probably, including inchworms, that uh, we, we're happy to be spared. Of course, they do have a habit of getting into uh, our houses. This is actually Bob's drain pipe. And here they are making their nest inside his dryer, dryer pipe. And uh, they just find all kinds of places to, to put a nest and they, they prosper. And, and they have, as you can see, they have young. So enough, enough, <clears throat> enough of the imported birds. We do have two, two other sparrows. Real, the, the actually the house sparrow is not a proper proper sparrow. These are proper sparrows. They're called they're white throated sparrows. Can you hear that, Bob? Can you hear that? The song, yeah. They, the their song is a very piercing, high pitched song, and you hear them right now. They're they're actually. They are migrating birds. They come down here, they spend the winter, and then they go back to Canada in the boreal forest to have their young. And this guy here is, a, is a, what they're doing is they're just kind of tuning up for when they get get to their territory in Canada. And people like to say that they're saying, "Oh, oh, Canada, Canada, oh, Canada, Canada." So listen for that, particularly in the early morning as you come out, and you'll hear them. It's a, quite a sweet sound. And obviously they're called white throated because they have that white sort of bib. This is this is. I just wanted to put this up there to give you a sense of what bird migration is all about. Um, the red part is where where they lay their eggs and live in this this wild sort of thin forest that covers most of boreal Canada, and the blue part is where they come down in the winter, and you know obviously they fly south. What they they're doing is they. They fly just as far south from the, the forest where they breed to get get food during the winter. And the way these guys get food is they get down in the in the leaf and they jump backwards and they kick the leaves up and then they look for insects underneath where they just kicked. And and it's quite charming to watch them. They just hop backwards, hop backwards, hop backwards, peck, and they're they're uh, interesting to watch on the ground. But they can't obviously do that where the ground is frozen, where it, where it's snowy. So they'll come down as far as they have to do, just to get get you know to make a living. And then as soon as it begins to thaw, they go north. It's, and this this is true of all migration. If you think of bird migration, sometimes you think, well, God, you know, they they never where are all the ducks? They didn't the ducks didn't come down this year. The ducks didn't have to get here because nothing was frozen in New England, so they stayed in New England where they could live. Birds birds will only go as far out of their breeding range as they have to go in the winter time in, in the inclement weather to, to get something to eat. And then as soon as they come north, birds that are coming up from Venezuela and, and, and the south, for instance, will follow the, the budding leaves up, up the east coast of the, of the country and eat the insects as the, the leaves just appear. So that's, the, <clears throat> that's how, how migration works. And the, the another interesting thing about the white-throated sparrow is that there are two, what they call two more southern. <laughs> one of them has a white stripe, the one on the left has a white stripe above the eye, and the one on the right, unfortunately, doesn't look very much, but there's the tan stripe over the eye. And the real curiosity is that the tan stripes only breed with the white stripes, and the white stripes only breed with the tan stripes. Now, I don't know what the young look like. <laughs> It'd be a really interesting test to know, do the tan stripe papas only produce white stripe children, or but I don't know the answer to that one. So I'll leave you with that. That is a question of, of bird morphology. But uh, that is the white-throated sparrow, and you'll see them on the ground now. They are a true sparrow. The next one is a song sparrow, and these guys can hear that. That little song you hear in the mornings now all the time. It's they're very very. They're, they're setting up territory here. They breed here, and they they set up. In the backyard, we have one in the front yard and one in the backyard, and they're singing away, telling others, other song sparrows, "This is my territory. Don't come near. This is my territory." Bird song is designed to 
keep away rivals of the same species. They're not saying to me or you or blue jays, they're saying the other, other birds of the same species, the males are saying, you know, this is, this is where I, I've set up my territory and I've got my wife here and you guys go away. Or I'm hoping that I go away, but the males. Um, again, again the, the song sparrow is one of our most widespread sparrows. And if you look at this one, the way to tell them is this, this little, they're, they're stripy in the chest and there's a little black dot in the middle of the chest. And you can, you know, you go to the store or something, you see a bird up in the top of a, of a rolling chain link fence next to Stroh Snyder's. See, if you look, you, you can usually pick out that black dot. You can certainly hear the sound. This one here, if you look at down on the ground at the bottom of his breast, there's something red. That is a, a band. And this bird was banded by, by the Smithsonian. They had a, a, a suburban uh, bird banding project in 2017. And this bird was here in my yard until last year. So that is, what, five years that that bird seemed to breed, survive here in our yard. I unfortunately say, say I haven't seen it this year, so I don't really know. But that's that that's the song sparrow. So you got the white throated sparrow and a song sparrow, or the true sparrows that we have in our yard. And then there's the house sparrow, which is the English sparrow, which is you know what we used to call English sparrow. Um, but they're the three sparrows that you'll see around. Those are actually sparrows at your bird feeder, for instance. And so all the bird brown birds at your feeder though are not sparrows. So where are we? We've we've got two more small brown birds. They're, they're called finches. One is a goldfinch. And I think everybody in the audience probably has seen a goldfinch recently because they're so loud at this time of year. And the red one on the right is a, is a house finch. Um, these birds do breed here. They are our birds. Now, this is the goldfinch. And my, my neighbor, Kip, up the street on the other side of Bob, would come and say, you know, we've got, we used to have all these goldfinches. Now we just have none of these little brown birds. The goldfinch completely changes, at least the males, their color in the wintertime. And so the one on the left is a male goldfinch with just a little bit of yellow around the throat, but otherwise just a sort of nondescript brown bird with blackish wings. And the females are even more drab. They're just completely solid, this nice soft tan color, but that's just, just the way they are. And then come April, the male just like overnight sheds that brown color and turns out to be this, this orange big bright yellow thing on the right and now i don't know if you if you have a feeder you you undoubtedly have seen these guys around right now they're everywhere and it's just like a, a flash of bright gold in the in the air they're they're lovely little birds they're the interesting thing about them is that they will be at your feeder until july well late june and july and then they disappear and that's when they nest they nest out in in the trees and in the fields in the late summer when the thistles are all blooming because that's what they eat. They prefer, over anything else, they prefer thistles. So if you have the way to attract them all summer, frankly, is to, to have one of these upside down thistle feeders, the you know, Niger, uh, they will come to that those little tiny black seeds all summer long. Um, and, it's, and it's fun to have a little bright yellow thing in the middle of the summer when it's too hot to go outside, but you can look at them there. Now. These are both house and goldfinches. And the, bottom, the bird at the bottom there is the back of a goldfinch. The two at the top are house finches. One on the right bottom is another goldfinch. They're, they can get inside the wire your feeder. They're, they're great, great feeder birds. The house finch, I think if, you, if you've been looking outside today, these days, you've seen these guys. They are bright orange red. And the male, males are bright, I should say. The one on the right is also a female. And she, like the female uh, goldfinch, is just drab and, and in, in trying to be sort of subtle and quiet. She has these dark brown stripes on, on her belly, and she's just quietly trying to mind her own business. The, the male is, they're, they're, they're pretty pushy, and they're bright orange, orangey red at the sound of you. Um, the curious thing about house finches is they are, they are also not native to our eastern seaboard, they were a, a, a bird of the arid southwest for most of eternity. And then in 1939, there were a bunch of them were released 
I, apparently by accident from a New York City pet store. And they have taken over. And they're, they're just about the most uh, numerous small bird in many cities now in the East. They only live in cities. They don't, you'll never, I don't think you'll ever see one out in the countryside. They're kind of like the house bear. They love the cities. They're very happy here. And, and they, they just, they don't migrate. They, they love our lawns and they love our feeding stations. They list, they, they like the house bear, they'll live in any, anybody's vent or, or you know, dryer vent or whatever. And, and they're, they're our local finch. So there they are, a, a bright orange, orange faced bird at this time of year or, or a brown looking female, there's going to be house finches. So you got the goldfinch and the house finch. So those are our two finches. So those are, those are all the birds that people say, oh, I've just got sparrows at my feet. Well, they're not sparrows, look closely. They'll either be the, the house finch, and the house finch is red all the time, all year round, sort of, but not like now. But the goldfinch, again, it's, it's yellowish all year round, but now it's gold. Uh, so those are, those are some of our most common feeder birds. Now, there, there's some other feeder birds that, that we see, one, usually just sort of one at a time, these I call them small charmers. I like these little birds. They are they are really just they have personality. Let's start with the nuthatches. I mean, who could this this guy? Oh, I'm sorry, that's his song. You've heard him. If, if you walk in the dog in the morning this time of year, it's 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 not it's the best they can do. I, it's just quack 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 quack. That that is the go the the nuthatches song and. They basically make a living going up and down the trees, finding insects underneath the bark and, and eating the seeds. They will come to your feeder, usually just one at a time, though at this time of the year, sometimes you'll see a pair and they'll tolerate each other, but usually they're just one at a time. And they, just, they, they are one of our real woodland birds, but they come, come to our, around our houses. And I think they're quite an elegant bird. I, I'd like this Charlie picture of one. Sort of hyper of what that little buff underneath the bottom, and that cool black stripe across the head. Anyway, that that is it. Oh, there's this was on my deck rail again. This is a mom feeding a baby last two years ago. So you know they do they do live here and they do do breed. Now, of course, many people know the chickadee. This is a Carolina chickadee, because there's another chickadee which you can't tell. I can't tell apart from this called the black cap chickadee. But for us, our chickadees are southern, a southern chickadee. And they're just they're just a cute little bird. They come, they'll come to your feeder. You'll see them around, but one at a time, they're very shy and they're very fast. And they'll come and grab a seed and then they'll run off and, and hide on a branch and, and peck away. They're, this is one that I found for their song is this it says chickadee. You probably can't. Maybe you can hear that chickadee like that. They're they're very small. They're like about three inches, and they're they're really a very cute. So I leave you with that. Another a rather cute bird is, and this one. If you haven't heard this in the morning, it's not because they are singing Peter 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 all morning. This is the beginning beginning. Of they're setting up. Their territory here, like the chickadees and, and the uh, nuthatches, they're here in our woods all year round. These are resident birds, and again, the titmouse is a, they, they all three of these birds list nest in cavities in our, our trees, and they like our woody so they, they moved here for the same reason we did. We like the trees, they like the trees, and they're they're one of our sort of endemic birds. They're not shy. They will come and look in your window if you don't look out, but uh, they're, they're a nice little bird. So those are the tufted titmouse um, with the Peter, Peter, Peter song. A similar song is the Humphrey Carolina Wren. And this is a bird you will hear in the morning. Lots now. Like, like all of them, they're setting up territory. They're singing, say, it's my territory. Um, don't, everybody stay away. It's my territory. It, it, they are a southern bird. It's called a Carolina wren. And 
I like to think you come out on a morning when it's been 10 degrees or, or even cold, any cold morning. And they're usually out there in January, February, singing that song. And I like to say to the yes, they're Carolina Rams, but we, we made it through the night. We made it through the night, another cold night. We're still here. Um, the, the interesting thing that the males are the only ones that sing in, in the wren department. And two wrens, if you hear two Carolina wrens singing that kind of teacher, teacher, teacher song, they are, there are two males telling each other, okay, this is my territory. You stay over where you belong. And they, one of the curiosities is they will imitate each other. The one will sing, stay away, stay away, stay away. And the other one says, I can say, stay away, stay away, stay away too. And you say, no, 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 no. And he's like, I can say, no, 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 too. And they, they imitate each other, trying to see who can out sing the other one. <laughs> so you'll hear a lot of noise from them if you if you got your ears open early in the morning, particularly. Um, the females just make kind of churring sound and they only chur at other females. Now, there's, a, there's a, again, a Carolina ran, and this is a chick in, in my backyard about, I guess the first of June, a couple of years ago. Um, the, 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 the male and female look exactly alike, but the, you can see a little chip there. I just happened to look down at the grass and there was this little bird waiting to be fed by the mom. Well, okay, enough, enough of these brown birds. Let's, let's, let's do some color. Everybody has seen a card. I'm sure you all know a card. It, they really are the most extraordinarily red bird in the whole world, I think. They're under species in the country. They're almost everywhere west of the east of the Rockies. They're, they're the state bird, the seven bird, seven state. Um, they're year round here. Um, why are they so red? It, this theory is that they get that red uh, color from what's called ingestion of metabolic conversion and deposition of carotenoid pigments during molt. In other words, they eat red berries and it turns their they're, by the, in digesting red berries, the carotene in the red berry colors their, their feathers. So that's the male cardinal. But you know, the female cardinal, which you may or may not have thought about, is really quite a beautiful bird too, if you look at that. She's right now, and particularly, males, males are so loud at this time of year, it's kind of hard to, not to overlook the females, but especially in the wintertime, the females have this beautiful red beak and kind of russet color. They're just, they're a, they're a pretty bird too. Now, unlike the woodpeckers, the female and male cardinals, they, are, they both sing the same song, they both sing, and they sing to each other. So if you're out there and you hear, first you hear a cardinal, you say, oh, that's nice. And then you hear another cardinal not too far away, and you know, I wonder who, where he is. That's not necessarily he. That may be the, the spouse or the one who started the song, or vice versa. I didn't know this. I thought that was kind of this is one of the few I know of where the, the bird they actually do the males and females sing together. Owls do that too, but that's we'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, they live in the, so how about blue jays? I've done the red. How about the blues? You've heard them all over the place. Uh, they like our wood. They like the oak species. The nuts are they, they come around to the bird feeders. They they're here all the time, and you know they get a bad rap because they do they do get into other birds' nests, but they're they're really quite a wonderful bird. They're they're monogamous. They stay in family groups. Last year's brood helps with this year's brood. Um, they they will defend the territory against other birds, particularly owls and hawks. They're 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 not they're they're a nice bird. I I think you, they they get a bad a bad story. But then again, who can say? They. <laughs> the one of the this is an illustration from John White's um, book, Illustrations of Virginia, and um, I have to give you the quote from Alexander Wilson, one of the early American ornithologists. He said of the blue jay, "Is distinguished as a kind of bow among the feathered tenants of our woods by the brilliancy of his dress, and like most other coxcombs, makes himself still more conspicuous by the loquacity and the oddness of his tones and gestures." Well, they make all kinds of noises. You can be really fooled. A blue jay can sound just like a red-shielded hawk. And, and that scream, you say, where is that hawk? 
and they're just making the sound. Nobody knows quite whether they're trying to, to be, scare other birds by, by sounding like a hawk or whether they're actually trying to scare away the hawks. But anyway, they can, they can imitate a lot of stuff. They're just a very interesting bird. Family, nice families. Um, you know, they're, they're good family people. They're, they're good birds. So they're, they're, <laughs> there's a red-bellied woodpecker and a blue jay. Yeah, apparently, the, the blue jay is deferring to the red-bellied wood, wood, uh, woodpecker there. Now, this is not a colorful bird. But this is a bird that, that has now just arrived in our neighborhood. The catbird, you can hear the song. It's, they're, they're said to be a mimic. They don't really mimic that closely. They just have this long stringing out series of songs. And I don't know if Bob knows, but this I think that this bird comes back every year and nests in his backyard. And the, the neat thing, Bob, you just built that nice porch. If you listen in the evenings right now, you'll hear this bird singing this song. The male sings to the female on the nest. And so this is this is their evening their evening song. This is really quite a charming bird. They, they're soft gray, have a black cap, and they uh, they're they're a bird for me that symbolizes spring. Spring has come in in real. It's really really come now. Not a migrant, but a bird that's here all year round is the mockingbird. And they do, they are a perfect. You thought, there we go. What would you like in the imitate neck? They sing in phrases of three, usually, and they can imitate anything. anything. This one was, there's a, a crab apple tree at the bottom of our street, and this guy would sit up in that crab apple tree and, and tell everybody. Ah, this is my crab apple tree. Don't even think about coming around. And with this, this constant, constant song. Um, some, they, they said they have as many as 150 songs to one, one uh, bird. And there was one, when I worked at the Library of Congress, there was one that would sit on top of a holly tree at the intersection where there was a policeman. And he could imitate the policeman's whistle. That was in the days when policemen did have whistles. Traffic whistle to the point where you couldn't tell whether it was a cop or the mockingbird. They they are fabulous mimics. They're they're fun. They're a nice nice bird. They're they're one of our very local birds. This is around, these birds are around all year round. So okay, how about how about the big ones? Um, this is a crow, American crow. We have actually we have two crows. So I have to tell you to confuse things. The American crow and the fish crow, and they have a slightly different sound and i think they are competing with each other for our neighborhood over here and the, the crows are, are just constant everybody's heard of crows, i'm sure but you know look at that that's a beautiful bird and they're interesting birds they flock together if you if you want to see an owl or a hawk listen to the crows they, they have what's called an assembly call they'll tell y'all come everybody come here's, here's a predator here's a predator come and mob a an owl or, or a poor old, poor old hawk and it's it's really they're really interesting birds they they've they're very smart they're so smart that they we really don't know very much about them we we do know that in the 19th century they were almost they were just persecuted everybody thought they were bad birds and they shot them and the crow figured out that if they moved to the cities and the towns they would not be shot they wouldn't you know they were originally, you know, country birds. But if you if you could move to the city, why nobody would shoot you? So now they're almost entirely an urban bird, and they they live by their wits in you know from the star Starbucks trash and whatever it happens to be. They do eat other birds' nests and you know, nestlings, and there there's some things about them that you know nature's red and tooth and claw. But they're they're really quite an interesting bird. They say that that it's very hard to catch. If you do, if you ban him, never see him again because they, they, the crow, crow is much too smart to ever be caught twice. So we don't know very much about crows because of that, other than just by what we can get from observing them. Um, this is not a crow. This guy, the crow, you'll never see on your feet, probably. But grackles are here all the time. And they, they are these big black birds. They're year-round residents. They like the suburbs. They like parks. They they 
they're just a they used to be big uh, grain eaters and, and farmers don't like them because they can clean out a, a, a wheat field or a corn field thousands and thousands of grackles but there there are lots of them in the city and right now they're my wife keeps saying oh, there's another one of those big black birds on the bird feeder and and I think actually I look out my window there is one right there right now but you know they're they are birds and they are big and black and shiny and they're easy to see and they're kind of fun for that that reason and look at this how how could you not like a bird with a big yellow eye like that and and such a glossy this is a purple grackle well duh, yeah it's purple isn't it that so that's that's the that's the grackle they are pretty one of our biggest birds around the yard so let's go small the, the littlest bird we have of course is a ruby-throated hummingbird and you don't see them right now if you see one right now probably he'll be a male coming through the males come up they, they winter in New Mexico in Mexico and Central America some of them believe it or not fly all the way across the Gulf of Mexico without stopping they're just extraordinary acrobats they're they're incredible their wings are situated in such a way they can fly backwards and forwards up and down uh, they're they're when you watch them they're really fast and they're fun to watch and you can have them in your yard if you put put in any flower this is a salvia that was in a window box by by our uh, deck um, cardinal flower any of those big those blooming late summer tubular flowers will attract the hummingbirds the males have a wonderful red gorget I'll show you a picture in just a second um, it's if you turn the bird turns just right the feathers the crystals in the feathers reflect light in such a way that it's it's this brilliant red color it's the only really only hummingbird we have on the east the west is full of hummingbirds but they're all in the west um you this is a female in, the, in my photograph and the, what comes through later in the in the summer are females and uh and the first year males and none of them have the red gorget. Occasionally, we'll see them, but but basically they're not there. And this is a picture of what one looks like if if you can catch the light just right. Friend friend of mine made this, and I've never been able to get a picture like that. You get that, frankly, you rarely see them like that because they have to turn just the right way. It, it is interesting. This is a picture I took of a female and a nest. That nest is about as big as a well, I guess maybe a half dollar at the most. And you can see she's tiny, and that's even smaller. And the little the little hummingbirds just kind of pop right out of the nest. It's made with they make it with spider silk and thistle thistle down, and they they cover the outside. If you look at the outside, those little flecks are lichen, little bits, little tiny bits of lichen, and it's it's really quite a remarkable con construction, and and very small. So what else is out there? Well. That's not an owl, that's a duck. And it's called a morning duck because they, somebody said that's a morning, sad morning sound, M-O-U-R-N. But you hear it in the morning, M-O-R-N, but it's not named for the morning, it's named for the sadness of the sound. That's, this is the most, it's, a, it's considered a game bird and it's the most popular apparently game bird in the country. And they're all over the place and they evidently those who, the people who dove season, we had a place on Eastern Shore, dove season was the, everybody went out with a shotgun and trying to shoot doves. The doves are not stupid. They, they may seem kind of slow, but they're not. And when dove season comes around, they just fly really quickly from one place to the other. And it's just like a bolt of lightning. You, it's, people tell me who actually shoot doves that it's, it's, it's almost impossible to shoot a dove. But these are, these are morning doves that uh, we, we have around here. But these guys are here all year round. And they're, you know, they're pretty. They're a pretty soft bird, and they're they have that sort of nice soft sound. This is doves in a, in a tree top, just a whole bunch. So if you look up in the trees and you see birds with long tails like this and little tiny heads, sort of, I don't know what, what you call a figure, but but small head, long tail, and sort of rounded middle. That's the silhouette of a morning dove. You'll you'll see them around lots. Um, Okay, those are the here we get to the, the, the meat of the project, the birds of prey. Now we've 
we've been talking about little birds and big birds and whatever, but these these are the, the kings of our forest, kings of the urban forest. And they're, they're, we have hawks and owls and vultures that are here. You won't necessarily um, have seen them, but they're, they're definitely here. This is actually a red-tailed hawk just down the street, taken way up in the trees. You know, you have to look for a silhouette in a tree that just doesn't look like it quite belongs there, and it'll be usually a hawk. So, this is only flying over. Would you? How about an eagle? Would this be an eagle? Well, did it? Does it have a white head? Can you see? Does it have a white head? Don't see eagles have white tails and white heads. Sometimes you see one flying over, but this one doesn't look like. Aha! Uh -huh. This is a turkey vulture. You see these guys all the time, but usually way up in the air, and they're 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 vultures. They they clean out deer carcasses. They road kill. They're they're quite useful animals. And there are lots of them around. And so when you look up in the air and you see something sort of floating along with, with these big wings, it's not an eagle, it's a turkey vulture. But I mean, the redhead is not maybe the most attractive thing in the world. It's, it's useful. There are no feathers on their head because they're sticking their heads in a, into carcasses and they don't get covered with, well, never mind. But anyway, that's, that's a, bit, a bit of turkey vulture sanitation. Um, there, that's, I actually did have one, not at our feeder, but it was on the deck rail. There was a dead squirrel. I don't know how it got there. There was a dead squirrel on our on our back deck in the wintertime several years ago. And I looked at it one day and I thought, my God, there's a turkey vulture sitting on the bird feeder. And I couldn't figure it out. And I finally figured out that there was this dead squirrel down there. That's the only time I've ever seen one here in the town of Chevy Chase on the ground. But you'll see them on the roads all the time. These hawks, red shoulder hawks, you'll hear all the time now. And there's, there's the scream is multiple screams. And I see the easy way to remember that is they have two shoulders, they have multiple screams. They're, they're, they love our suburbs. They love these big trees. They love our, our chubby. They pick me, I think, like I hope anyway, the, uh, the rabbits and the mice and, and the starlings apparently. And yes, the morning loves too. They, they are, perch hunters, they sit on a, on a tree branch like this, waiting for something to happen down below them and then hop just right down. And they're, they're quite remarkable and there, there are lots of them around and you'll hear them particularly. They're not that easy to see, but you will, you will hear them uh, as you, if you walk about nowadays. They, if you see one flying, the, the, red, the red shoulder hawk has this wonderful bands on the tail. And so they'll be really quite obvious to you if, if you see one taking off. The red tail hawk, the other hawk, or one of the three hawks that we have in the neighborhood, and as well as you can see, they eat squirrels. Uh, this one, and they have this fabulous red tail. And so they, again, they're, they're quite happy with human habitation. There's all the stories about, you know, the red tails in love and all in New York Central Park. Um, well, we don't have to go to Central Park. They're here all over the place. This was taken. And just just in a tree just from my deck uh cut several years ago and they you know, they're they're crying so say i say well they have one tail they have this long drawn out uh cry like that wonderful picture it's showing the tail taken by a friend of mine there's one other hawk called a sharp shinned hawk which is a smallish hawk and a bird hawk and this this hawk this not a very good picture maybe but it was taken on the, on the rail of a chair of my neighbor across the street. And I mean, Fred sent me this. He said, why is this bird sitting on my chair? Well, he's sitting there wondering where the birds in the bird feeder are. Um, there, this is a sharp shinned hawk. And I, we'll stick with this picture a minute. If you look, he has long yellow legs. And he's called sharp shin because those shins of his legs are great for reaching into an azalea and grabbing a sparrow that thought he was safe. And they are there, somebody called them the enemy of all small birds. They, and they were hunted indiscriminately in the 1900s because people thought this was bad. But you know, what, it's, it's nature. And these hawks are, are, well, they're really quite around here a lot. One of them almost brained me. I mean, he was going for a, a, a bird and, a, and I was walking the dog and he didn't care where I was. He just went flying right across my head. Uh, they're, they're not terribly afraid. Thank you.
sort of medium size, and I had this wonderful, the males, the, the mature ones have this wonderful red eye, if you can tell there, that's a mature sharp shin hawk. Um, then, of course, we have the owl. This is, we haven't heard as many as I'd like to say we've heard in the last few years, but this is a barred owl. First of being saying, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all? And two of barred owls will set up. They do it back and forth, male and female. And it's the fabulous sounds. And they, they just, they sometimes have this, they end up with this, this sort of maniacal laughter. They're called barred owls. They're, they're a wood owl. And they, you can see them in the daytime more often than, than any other owl. And they're called barred because right at their throat, they have what they're horizontal bars. It doesn't show around the picture. And you, they're, they're named for that. That's why they're called a barred owl. Um, they like rabbits, they like squirrels, and, and they, they are nocturnal hunters. And so anything out there tonight, I think sometimes I hear a scream and I think, well, there's another rabbit gone. Um, but they're out there at night, of course. And finally, there's a the great horned owl. They're supposed to be saying, who's awake? Me too. Who's awake? Me too. And Barn Owl, what's called a perch outside. They sit up there quietly and wait till the rabbit thinks it's, it's got a free run and they're down out of the tree. We we thought we heard them in the part of in the town where I live. a couple of years ago. We thought we had a pair and a friend of mine did find a pair um, near, not, not too far from Rockville. And we were, we spent a lot of time looking at tree crotches. This is what a great horned owl nest looks like. I don't know if you can tell. You can't tell in the left-hand picture. It doesn't look like anything. Just maybe some, barely some sticks in this crotch. If you get, get a scope or get really good binoculars, you can see there's the mother owl there sitting on the nest in this just totally indistinguishable pile of sticks. And if, if you're really lucky, that's what happened. That's what a baby great horned owl looks like. So that's the sum of, the, of our birds, at least from the, from the smallest to the biggest. And I think that, that if you see, if you can remember, you can remember all 30 of these, I believe. And if you can't remember them, here's a list. If you've got a screen, a way to do a screen capture, um, I, I can't share it any other way. I'll just leave this up. Uh, this, is, this is the 30 birds that we've seen. And believe me, if, when you walk out tomorrow, you'll look at them and I hope I've told you a little bit of, of, about each one so that you'll remember something and you'll be able to say, oh, that's a house finch. That's right, that's not a sparrow, that's a house finch. Or that's a great horn owl. Anyway, I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope this, this has been a, an introduction or a review of the birds that you knew already. So at this point, Kristen, it's Bob, it's, it's your, your show. I'm here, I can take questions, anything that you want. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. This is fantastic. And um, listening to all this, I mean, so many of these sounds are familiar. And now it's great to begin to, to match them up with the birds. I have to tell everybody that we didn't quite know how the sound worked on the Zoom. And it was, it was 159 when we figured this out. And if we hadn't figured it out, I think we would have had to ask Chris to make all those sounds himself, which actually would have been another show for us. But um, and and I, and just to, to see all these photos of um, your deck and and clearly, you know, this is sort of like so close to home. I, I think it was a real treat for all of us. So I really want to thank you for that. Um, I know there are some questions, um, Chris. How would you like to? We've seen some in the chat, and I know there will be. I think you said we'd be happy if people just wanted to unmute themselves and ask questions too. Um, let's let's. I'll tell you what. Maybe we should start. If you whoever's got the control of the chat, look and see if there's anything in the chat that we can do. And once we've done with the chat, the question is already logged in the chat. Then we can just just talk. Okay. Um, one question: Any hints to keep house sparrows from hoarding uh, the bird feeders? No. <laughs> and the honest answer is I don't. <laughs> Um, I, I look at my I just look out the window right now. There's probably there's four house sparrows and a starling on our feeder. Um, I 
sometimes there are some times of the year when it's worse right now it seems worse but also the finches are there so you don't want to tr take your feeder down because you got these great fin the very brightest finches are there too i feed hulled sunflower seed and I, let me let me put in a word for that hulled sunflower seed is expensive but it's it's the the best thing to get the birds you want don't feed millet that the definitely millet is something that will attract sparrows and morning doves and, and birds you don't really care about um, also, don't feed sunflower seed, black oil sunflower seeds in the shells, because the shells, the birds will shell the, the, the seeds, drop the shells on the ground, and the, the shells apparently attract rats. So you want to sell, you want to feed something that will stay, have the least trash and attract the words that you want the most. And I think from my experience, it's, it's for the general birds, it's whole sunflower seeds. And for uh, for the, the goldfinches, it's going to be the Niger, and that's really in the summertime. So here's a question. There's a bird in my yard that exactly imitates my alarm clock every morning. <laughs> Is that a mockingbird? I, I guess the question was, what time does the bird go off? <laughs> it's the same as the, what you'd like the alarm clock to do. But is it, could that be a, uh, a mockingbird? Mm, not necessarily. Actually, probably not, because the... I think it well. I think maybe it's just just happenstance. I suspect it's a cardinal. Well, I don't know. I really, without hearing it, I wouldn't couldn't tell you. Okay. Uh, so some... Looking bird seems to be more a daytime bird. So I, I would guess it's from from our window open this time of year. They're the first bird you hear is a cardinal, and they're loud and they're singing just before dawn. They are. It's interesting, the cardinal, because it's, it's, it's red color, it's supposed to be what's called a crepuscular bird, a dawn and dusk bird. Of course, they're out here right now, but, but they're, they're particularly evident at dawn and dusk when most other birds have gone to bed. And the red color apparently is not visible to many animals uh, and when, when the, the sunlight goes down. So I, my guess is a bird singing, there are two birds that will be singing early in the morning, well, the Carolina wren, cardinal, and the titmouse are the birds that you're going to sit here in the early morning and the first ones. That's the best I can do with that. <laughs> I wanted to know, um, probably. Car Carol Owecki asks, do we have screech owls? I'm sorry, say it again. Do we have screech owls? Well, yes and no. Um, the screech owl, let me just start by saying the screech owl doesn't make a screech. The screech owl is a little small owl, just not much bigger than your hand extended, that lives in a cavity and has a whinnying sound. So I haven't heard a screech owl in our neighborhood, and I, this is the town of Cherry Chase, in four or five years. We most used to hear them very often. I've never seen one. No, wrong. I have seen one. I have photographed the one in a tree that roosted in the across the street 10 years ago, maybe, for just one day, night. Um, and then he flew into your yard, Bob. He, he was across the street and he jumped out of the tree just at sundown and just flew out of that tree and flew into your azaleas after something. And that's the last I ever saw of him. Um, that, the, so the answer to the question is, yes, we have had screech owls. No, I haven't personally heard them and i don't think i've heard anybody else say they've seen them recently which is kind of sad i don't know the answer for that okay um here's this one from ken uh, emicholt he says we've seen many quote hairy woodpeckers why were they not on your list <laughs> <laughs> i wonder who get me a, i have beautiful photos of hairy woodpeckers and okay all right you asked for <clears throat> the hairy woodpecker is bigger is, is it almost as big, well, the hairy woodpecker looks just like the downy woodpecker, except half again as big. It's a beautiful white, black and white woodpecker. Um, and it's just all its proportions are bigger and, and less cute, more robust than the downy. And I didn't want to confuse things by saying that. Uh, anybody who wants to see some nice pictures of a downy woodpecker, Send me an email and I'll send you. They're, they're, they have been here. They're daily for some reason. Downy used to be 
red belly woodpecker and a downy woodpecker were pretty much the only woodpeckers, you know, recognizable woodpeckers we would have. And then, then of course, there, there was occasionally the pileated. And then about two years ago, uh, Carrie McInerney, my neighbor down the street, started, a, somehow she got a hairy, a hairy couple to, to nest around. They liked her bird feeder. And we started calling it the, 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 the hairy couple of Sycamore Lane. Well, this year I've been seeing both male and female Harrys on the, on the bird feeder. They've been coming regularly. And I didn't put them in there because I thought, okay, 30 birds is 30 birds, enough. But anybody who wants to see a picture of a Harry, they're here and, and they are beautiful birds. And while we're on it, I'll just say, so if there's a question there about purple, uh, purple finches, the, the, the orangey red house finch that, that I've shown pictures of is the normal finch we have here. For some reason, for the first time in my life, we have been getting purple finches as well. And the purple finch looks just like the, the, the house finch, except he says, there's a slightly blue tint to the orangey red instead, and they're a little bit whiter. And I have plenty of pictures of them, but I didn't want to confuse anybody. And 30 birds is 30 birds, enough. But anyway, there are, you know, there, there are lots of, Variations, you know, nature's never, never, never going to stop still for anybody. And maybe we'll wrap up with one last question, Sarah Demarest. What's the most unexpected bird you've seen in your yard? That's an interesting question. Uh, well, I think, well, for sure, um, the the uh, the turkey vulture was the most unexpected bird I ever ever thought to see in my yard. But indigo bunting, probably a beautiful blue bird that, that suddenly appeared in the, in the, against the green of the pine tree a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it, my neighbor on the other side, Bob, has Nellie Stevens hollies. These hollies uh, have a bloom that usually ha has occurred right at the time when the warblers come through. And the, the Nellie Stevens blooms apparently attracted bugs and the bugs attracted warblers and i saw some very nice warblers in there sadly this year i think we, we were the, the the migration season this year is very because we think of, of climate change the and it's really cold now but the leaves are fully out and what's what has happened i think is that we got that hot spell and a lot of things happen in a hurry plant-wise lots of bloom lot of, so now this Nellie Stevens holly as the, the warblers migrate mainly from the length of sunlight but the plants apparently uh do their seeding out there they're blooming through through heat I, I guess I'm not a botanist I don't know any rate this there's been not a single bird in these hollies this year that I have seen, and I haven't seen very many warblers anywhere, because I think that they're they're just flying over us. They look down there and they see all these leaves that are fully out, like summertime. They say, "Well, there are no little juicy bugs down there. They've already get up north where there's still some juicy bugs out." And that's that's my explanation. That wasn't actually the question you asked. The question you asked <laughs> was, "What was it? What was the unusual bird?" Yeah. The unusual birds has wonderful warblers in the in the hollies next door, but they're not there this year. Wow. Well, this has been terrific. Uh, and, and I think we've got a lot of um, great feedback also. Chris, I don't know if you've seen it in the chat room. Everybody really appreciates what you've done. I'll turn this over to Kristen for some uh, last last words. All right. Thank you, Bob. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. I hope everybody else has enjoyed it as much as I enjoy talking about birds. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob, and thank you, Chris, and to all of you for joining Chevy Chase at Home today for this edition of our speaker series. I invite you to explore other programming listed on our website and to consider joining your local village as a member or a volunteer. Thanks again. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Take care.